It is important for us to call on God out of our distress. Good morning, my name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television. It is a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. And we're doing that. We're in the book of Psalms now. And we're going to actually talk about this today. And it's important that you understand. We must call on God or out to God in our distress because we've sinned. Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God and we need to take care of that. We'll talk about that coming up in just a moment. Corey, what are you talking about today? Well, today we're going to be talking about some systems of men that were established to help us find God. We're going to be having a discussion about that later. All right, systems of man. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Now, you studied, yes. and what did you study? Well, we're going to take a look at Psalm 80, and we're going to talk about the titles and the subtitles that we often find associated with those psalms. Titles and subtitles mm -hmm. associated with the psalms that we're reading. Yes. Fascinating. This is interesting. All right, so we've got all these psalms, and we're in the book of Psalms, and we're discovering what they mean, titles and subtitles and everything else. Get your Bible out. Get your Bible guide out, and let us study right now. Here is Corey Henry Babechko. Over the next few days on this quick study program, I'm going to be talking to you about the time period of New Testament history because it relates so integrally to the Old Testament. First, you and I are going to be taking a look at the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a group of religious leaders who appear many times in the New Testament, often clashing with Jesus and even each other. The Sanhedrin made up the highest Jewish religious authority in the first century AD. Their claimed origin was with the 70 elders appointed by Moses in the Torah. But there doesn't seem to be much evidence backing this up. There are no references to the Sanhedrin in the Old Testament or in other ancient records. The Sanhedrin does appear on the scene sometime between the Old Testament and the New. The Sanhedrin likely formed after the Maccabean Revolt that brought political and religious freedom back to Israel for a time. Despite their late appearance, the influence of the Sanhedrin on life in first century Jerusalem was quite large. The Sanhedrin was made up of two main groups, the Sadducees and Pharisees. It is these two groups with their differing beliefs about the law that caused much of the tension recorded in the Gospels. The Sadducee party was made up of chief priests of the Jerusalem temple, who claimed to be descendants of Zadok, the high priest of King Solomon's time. Not all priests were Sadducees, but all Sadducees were priests, and aristocratic priests at that. The Sadducees strictly believed that only the law, the five books of Moses, should be held as God-given. They rejected the oral law of the Pharisees and any ideas of a spiritual world beyond God existing. The Pharisees, who made up the main body of the Sanhedrin, focused mainly on synagogues and public life. Their very title means separated ones, and they were viewed as teachers of the people. They held on to the Mosaic Law and also the Oral Law, a law code about the Mosaic Law. The main clash between the Pharisees and Jesus was over Jesus' criticism of this Oral Law. The Sanhedrin, though often divided, held much influence in Jerusalem, and when united on an issue, could force real action by Rome. It is my personal conviction, of course, that the Sanhedrin rulers in the first century AD got it wrong when it came to not accepting Jesus as the Messiah. And in fact, there were some members of the Sanhedrin, according to the New Testament and early church history, that actually agreed that Jesus was the Messiah. And I bet you that that was very contentious among them. But one thing that's very refreshing here about the Sanhedrin is that it was composed of men who had very contrasting ideas about uh, the interpretation of the Old Testament. So there's some um, something to be learned here from holding different perspectives uh, about the details, but really being able to come together and work together uh, out of your love for God. I think that's a huge takeaway point that we can look at here uh, with the Sanhedrin. Um, now, we're going to be taking a look a little bit later on in the program with another system of men uh, instituted uh, by the Jewish people based off of tradition 
and, and, and you know, it's, it's really important. We're going to be talking about the concept of community synagogues. Now, of course, the temple is no longer existing today, so the synagogue in Jewish culture has taken a much more prominent role, whereas still in the first century AD, there was a temple. So the temple was the primary place where you would come to worship God, but the synagogue was still an integral part of the community as an everyday place of learning and daily worship towards God. So we're going to be talking about that in a little bit. There is great strength when we call upon the Lord. He is the God of the universe. His word says that when we call on him, he will deliver us. Even if we've been rebellious, we must still call upon the Lord. That's the message of Psalm 79, whose subject reads like this, a dirge and a prayer Israel destroyed by the enemy. The psalm is a psalm of Asaph. It's amazing truth to place our meditations in for a lifetime. Israel sinned and rebelled. God let destruction overtake them. Nevertheless, the priest calls on God in a song. Will the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob hear them? Let's explore. Psalm 79, verses 1 through 13. O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. Your holy temple they have defiled. They have laid Jerusalem in heaps. The dead bodies of your servants they have given as food for the birds of the heavens, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. Their blood they have shed like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to those who are around us. How long, Lord? Will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. O oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Help us, O oh God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, Where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight the avenging of the blood of your servants, which has been shed. Let the groaning of the prisoner come before you. According to the greatness of your power, preserve those who are appointed to die, and return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach with which they have reproached you, O Lord. So we, your people and sheep of your pasture, will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. Psalm 79, verses 1 through 13. Everything we go through in life is designed to help us and motivate us to call upon God the call of God. We get in trouble, we call upon God. We have a problem, we call upon God. That's what we're talking about today. And thank you for staying with us. You've just heard the psalm we're going to read and study today. We're going to slow it down just a little bit so we can listen to what the Lord is saying through this beautiful, amazing song of faith.
Now, I want to remind you that we have four points, and the four points are important. They are in the Bible Guide. And the Bible Guide presents you with the four points plus the daily wisdom of this day, and it's excellent. So there's one page for every day, and if you don't have yours, if you want yours, you can write to us around the end of the program, and we'll show you how you can get a hold of it. Very important. The Bible Guide is the print companion to this program. Well, let's take a look at the scripture. Let's slow it down and consider what God is saying. Our review is wisdom in calling on God. And our reading is Psalm 79 to Psalm 80. And so if you read that, you'll keep up with us in reading through the Bible in one year. Our focus is Psalm 79 verses 1 to 13. Now we're going to focus on three of the four points as we study this and ask God, Lord, what are you saying to us? So let us begin the scripture as we look at Psalm 79, verses 1 through 4. Listen carefully to God's word as we study it. O oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. Your holy temple they have defiled. They have laid Jerusalem in heaps. And the dead bodies of your servants they have given as food for the birds of the heavens the flesh of your saints, to the beast of the earth. Their blood they have shed like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors. We become a scorn and derision to those who are around us. Now, this is an amazing read that we have to understand because we learn that we must call out to God. In our distress, because we have sinned, we must repent. You see, the problem is that we have to understand that we are sinners and we come to Jesus Christ and he fills our hearts so that when God looks upon us, when we say, Lord, take my sin, Lord, help me today, God looks upon us, he doesn't see us in our original form. He sees the nature of his son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived a perfect life and let himself be killed and rose again on the third day. That's who he sees. And so it is the strength of Jesus Christ that gives us the energy. And so it's important for you to understand that we're no better than you. If you have not taken Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're no better than you. We just figured out where he is. God told us, and, and he tells you today to come to Jesus because his nature upon you will make you acceptable to God as you reach out to him. Very, very important. And that's what we need to do. We need to understand that. And when we pray to God, we don't need to say, Lord, give me this and help me here. We need to say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And then, Father, help me in this area and that area. Very important that you understand the nature of prayer. Let's move on then to the next verse. It says in Psalm 79, verses 5 through 9, How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that, that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and lay waste his dwelling. Oh, do not remember the former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Help us, O oh God, for our salvation, for the glory of your name. And deliver us and provide atonement for our sin, for your name's sake. Now that's an interesting point. Your name's sake. It brings me, we must call on God for his name's sake. This is the only way that God truly will respond. I learned this very young when I was in high school. And I came to Jesus Christ. And in high school, I figured out, I, I read the Psalms, and I discovered that it's important that I say, Lord, for your name's sake, save me here, help me here, change me here, help me to be like you. And I put myself towards seeking God. Now, there's a lot of Christians, so-called Christians today, who come to Jesus, but they don't seek God. But if you come to Jesus Christ, and that's what you want, that's what you desire more than anything else, then God will give you his spirit 
and you will be changed forever. It is an amazing thing, and it's important for you to know that. Come to God and say, I want you more than anything. And then we go to Psalm 79, verses 10 to 12. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight the avenging of the blood of your servants, which has been shed. Let the groaning of the prisoner come before you. According to the greatness, the greatness of your power, preserve those who are appointed to die and return our neighbors sevenfold to their bosom, their reproach with that which uh, they have reproached you, O Lord. Now this brings us to our final point on the program today, and it's we must call on God when facing death. He will rescue us. And this is the most amazing thing that we see, the most amazing thing that, that we consider as we look at this. When we come to Jesus Christ, and it looks very dark in our place, and we say, Lord, rescue us. You know what he does? He rescues us. And let me tell you, if you're in prison and you're on death row, if you're in prison and you're needing a rescue, God will rescue and help you and save you. So come to Jesus Christ today. The Psalms tells us that in the name of Jesus Christ. The history of the synagogue likely goes back to the time period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So after the exiles returned from Babylon and built the temple again, because the practice was well established before the first century AD. The Greek word synagogue means assembly or gathering, and the buildings named synagogues in the first century AD were multifunctional community gathering places. It was said that wherever 10 Jewish men lived, there would need to be a synagogue, a place not only for learning and conversing about the scriptures, but also a place where children would learn to read, trespassers of the religious law would go for judgment, and as hinted at by a first century Greek inscription, they were a place where even weary travelers could go to rest. Synagogues were a place of gathering on Sabbath, where the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 would be recited, prayers would be had, scriptures read, and a sermon given. Synagogues were essential to first century Jewish and later Christian life yet without replacing the importance of the temple in Jewish practices. The temple in Jerusalem was where sacrifices would be given and yearly pilgrimages would be made during biblical festivals. It is believed that during the days of Jesus, the temple itself had a synagogue. This is thought to be where the 12 year old Christ spoke with astonishing wisdom to the teachers as recorded in Luke chapter two. There were a few key roles to fill within the synagogues that are mentioned. The synagogue ruler, who was in charge of the overall building and all of the service planning. The elders, who kept the policies of the synagogue and would act as judges towards trespassers of the law and those policies. The minister, who was the smart muscle of the synagogue, in charge of cleaning, keeping the Torah safe, keeping the lamps lit, and running the local elementary school by teaching children how to read. A position that changed all the time and was chosen by the ruler was the delegate, a guest chosen beforehand to read, pray, or teach. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus enjoyed the position of delegate many times. This is an interesting place with you, Ryan. Welcome to space. It's good this, to have you here. It's amazing here. I've got yeah, stars. Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? There's stars everywhere. It's great. And I wanted to be here. I wanted to show the people who you were because your mother and I were recently down at station at Cornerstone Television, actually. And they said, tell, tell Ryan and tell Corey that we really love their segments and we like what they're doing. And so they wanted to thank you for all that you're doing. Well, that's very kind and gracious because I'm just having a lot of fun doing what I'm doing. So I want to thank 
all of you who have written in and, to, and supported this ministry. And that's important because if you've written in or if you know, or you sorry, if you haven't written in and you want to think about supporting this ministry, let me tell you, please do. We could use your help. This is a program that's supported by people who write into us. Ask for the pocket guide. The pocket guide is the print companion to this particular program for the entire month. And there's 12 of them. There's seven here. And these are right up through uh, July. But write for it and send whatever you can. Pray about it and ask God what he would have you do. The address is on the screen. There's the U.S. address and the Canadian address. If you're in another nation, use the Canadian address. And remember, www.biblediscoverytv.com. Welcome back and thank you for staying with Quick Study Television as we go through the Bible in one year. It's very, very exciting. <laughs> and I want to tell you that next time on the teaching, we're going to talk about something interesting. Here it is. We're going to be talking about good and godly revelation can begin with a problem. That's right, a problem. So we'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. <laughs> Hope you're here. And Janice and mm -hmm. I want to know what you studied. Well, I can tell you that we looked at Psalm chapter 80. And I wanted to talk a little bit about when you're reading through the Bible, if you're new to the Bible, you will notice in the Psalms that many of them have titles and subtitles. So that's what I thought we would touch on just briefly today because Psalm 80 has several things listed under it. In my particular version of the Bible, which is the New King James, which I really enjoy, it says this, it's Psalm 80, prayer for Israel's restoration. It's written to the chief musician and it's set to the lilies. It's also said that it's a testimony of Asaph, a psalm. So we have a lot of information here, Rod, already on the psalm, and that's before we've even begun to read it. So the lilies, this is apparently a known tune at the time of this composition. Each psalm is actually a song. It's a piece of music. So this tune, the lilies, was a composition that would have been known at that time, similar to in Psalm 22, it's uh, played to the deer of the dawn. I just find that the really lilies fast. and the deer of the, the dawn. Deer of the dawn. Really? Isn't that interesting? So someday when we are in eternity, I'm going to find out what the lilies sound like and also the deer of the dawn. I can hardly wait. Now, Asaph also, he's listed here. It's a testimony as, of Asaph called a psalm. And Asaph, of course, was one of David's chief musicians. And he was also the ancestor of a group of temple musicians. Really? From way back in the beginning. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So now this, these are in the, the pre-titles or the, the subtitles. Right. right after, when, when the psalm is listed for yeah. us in the scriptures, then directly underneath that we see subtitles sometimes or, or all, the, all of this information is set even before we begin to read the actual psalm. So really it would be advantageous for somebody. Just, I'm just, I'm just throwing this out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. this, this is a throw out there. All right. Okay. For somebody just to read the Psalms, just go through and, and read the subtitles. Take, uh, take about, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, half an hour or whatever, and just read the subtitles and figure out how many songs like the lilies or the deer of the dawn yeah. or whatever are actually listed. Exactly. Somebody actually did this and somebody will do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you take this and, and it's interesting because... I just don't know what the Holy Spirit would reveal to you if you, well, if and, you did this. And the other thing is, last year when we read through the Bible chronologically, we realized that a lot of times it is listed in these titles and subtitles when David wrote them, because a lot of the Psalms were written by David. And so it helps you then when you're reading the Bible just the way we have it here, rather than the chronological order, then you can go back and actually study that the time that David would have written that. It may have been a time when he's hiding from Saul, or it may have been a time when he uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. There were all kinds of different scenarios in here where these Psalms were written. And, and the times when David, you know, there were things that happened to David 
David and his family mm -hmm. and in his life. And there were songs that he wrote when he was fleeing Jerusalem. Right, or, or in great victory. <laughs> or in great victory. And he spent seven and a half years in Hebron before mm -hmm. actually uh, Jerusalem. And it was very, this is all very interesting. And, uh, you, you know, you study this and you study the subtitles mm -hmm. of the Psalms and you begin to understand how this thing works. Well, there's so much information and a lot of times we just breeze over these things and go right into uh, the Psalm, but we miss some of the finer little details. And actually, the finer little details are what's important. And so it's not scripture, it's the subtitle, but I would encourage you uh, to do that, to check the subtitles out before you actually read the Psalms because they're very interesting and very good. Right now here is Watch and Pray. Praising the name of God is good and a healthy exercise in this fallen world. The Lord makes us men and women of hope and possibility when we master the art of praising his name. The end of Psalm 79 explains, quote, So we, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations, close quote. The writer says he learned and will continue to teach what it means to praise the name of God, not only to his generation, but also to the generations to come. This is critical for life of the church in today's world and the people of God. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, what in the world does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ lived 2,000 years ago and that he died on the cross, allowing himself to be killed. But he rose again in the flesh on the third day. And he is God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And I want to tell you, he says, if you call on him now and say, Jesus, come into my life, I need you as my Lord. And he will do it and you will change. Oh. <laughs>